10 past, so let's get started. So I hope that you can welcome will join us eventually. Okay, so last week we learned how to express electric and magnetic fields and potentials, and in particular, we've calculated the relation now between potentials and the charge and current distributions. That, of course, was true only in one gauge, that we talked about gauge transformation, gauge symmetries, in which gauge can the potentials be calculated this way. We talked about the Coulomb and the Lorentz gauge, which gauge is that where you can express the potentials this way. Which one is that? No. Everybody agree with the Coulomb gauge? Does everybody agree? No, it's not. This is actually the Lorentz gauge. But in the Coulomb gauge, remember the Coulomb, we had said that the versions of A was zero, right? And the Lorentz gauge. Was the condition for the Lorentz gauge for the divergence of A? And the general expression for A is a function of J. There was this funny cross term that had divergence A then plus minus. But, um, you will not epsilon not in E over dt there, right? And the Lorentz gauge was made so that this, this term that contained these two terms was dropping out, right? So this actually uh, is in the Lorentz gauge. Right? So here. symmetric way of writing V and A just simply as the Dunlop-Air of V is minus 4 epsilon. Good, so now let's step one, one step back and say if we are in a static, so from electro and magnetostatics, static that means uh, d over dt of everything zero. In that case, of course, this, this first equation there reduced to Laplace of, of V was minus rho over epsilon naught, right? And that, in a situation like this, where you are sitting at some point of that R, you call any point in your source, you have the charges, the currents <coughs> distributed somewhere in here. So here you have some rho of r prime, t prime, and you have currents of r prime, t prime here. And the potentials you get, you calculate from the point of r, from the position of your charges. And we write this down again, that we call this old German style script R as the vector from your source to the point where you calculated the potentials. So that's R minus R prime. Right. So that's this vector. From that you can calculate that there is no time change, so everything, nothing depends on time. Then the potential could be calculated as we write this out explicitly, so potential at this point R, 
but we calculated how, we even had this on the board last week, how we calculate the potential, the static, the electrostatic potential, if you just have a static charge distribution there. But it's simply just one charge, one charge Q, and you're away some distance R. And of course, V of R was and V of R is what is the charge, what is the potential of just a point charge Q, your distance R away, then the potential is somebody else. Potential of joint point charge if you're Probably? Seriously? If you look at all the things you know in the homeworks, then there must be something left, right? So the one thing about the homework, obviously there is, I mean everybody did a great job there. But obviously there's only a limited number of problems that one can possibly come up with. So pretty much for everything, you can probably find a solution somewhere online. There's no way for me to police that. But if, if you look it up somewhere, at least make sure you understand what you're copying. There's no way for me to police whether you find the solutions online somewhere. Probably there's a solution for everything somewhere. But at least make sure you understand what you're copying. So that's the potential of point charge. That's obviously the charge comes in there, right? How does it scale with distance? One over r, one over r squared, one over r cubed, times r. <laughs> no r dependence. Standard distribution, it's essentially the same thing, only that we have to integrate now over the entire volume. Right? So it's rho of r prime three prime over right. And this we can write as So this is the potential for a static, a static situation, and you can do the same. So for the uh, vector potential, you would just replace this by the recurring density J. Right? Does that look familiar? <coughs> okay, so now if we are no longer static, can we do the same thing? So, question. Can we write the potential at our point R at the time t at which we measure it as simply 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught? Now, of course, we have a time dependence here, right? Rho at any point in our volume <coughs> at the same time. We have here. We don't care about the times for now. Over, right? Can we? I mean, obviously we can do that, but that makes sense. Or we we'll possibly see a problem with that. So let's assume our source. Let me light here away. We have the same time here and here. What does that mean? You see a source and changing the light here away from you. What would this tell me? 
mean that time is the same, right? If this, if this was true, and the time at which you have the potentials here is exactly the same time at which you evaluate what the charges are. Can that be? So this, this would mean that if the charges are changing somewhere a light year away, you would immediately feel the effect here. Right? Because whatever happens here will take some time delta t to reach us, right? What is that time delta t? So how much later do you see the effect of anything happening here? With what speed does the information travel? C with the speed of light. Right? So the time difference is just this, this distance that the information has to travel over C. Right? So that means if we measure the effect now, we see the source as it was this time difference earlier. Right? Just if you we, most of you might go into astronomy or something, you look at things light years away. If you look at a galaxy 10 million light years away, you see the galaxy as it was 10 million years ago. So that means the time at which we see this is actually retarded, as we call it, by this time difference. So we see it actually at a retarded time, that is our time minus R over C, right? So this is called retarded time. So this is of course for now only pretty much a guess. Now we have we've just assumed that maybe maybe this law doesn't change at all if time if things are actually time dependent. We only need to take this retardation effect into account. So what we need to do is, so that means the next thing we need to do is check whether, whether actually the d'Alembert on this V of R equals minus rho of R t right over epsilon t. So we need to verify that we have constructed this property so that we actually solve this equation. So, let's do that. So we have to calculate what the d'Alembert, the d'Alembert was Laplace uh, V minus 1 over C squared V2 V over T squared, check if that really is minus rho over epsilon. So let's do this in two steps here. So let's calculate, first of all, what is, what is the gradient of V. So of course the plus V is, you can write this as the gradient of the divergence of the gradient of V, right? Okay, so let's start out. What is the gradient of V of R and T? <coughs> First thing, so we have to be a little bit careful here now that we don't confuse things that depend on R, where we evaluate the potentials, and R prime, where the sources, where the charges are. If we take the gradient, so obviously this depends on what we have here on the right hand side, depends on, through this connection vector, depends on, on both R and R prime. Right? And we have rho that only depends on where we are in the source. And then we have this TR, this retarded time, that again depends on, on the distance between us and the source. So, which, which R are we differentiating by? If we take the, the, the gradient of V, is it this R or this R? Is it 
to the ROR prime, which are which is the derivative. Calculating the gradient of V. V actually only depends on yeah, well, where we evaluate it. Right? So be careful now, it is this R that we get to do with it. Here everything is integrated over this volume, obviously the derivative here will depend on the point here. So let's just make write this out. It's the derivative at our point R, right? So this is, let's just plug this in now, 4 pi epsilon naught integral, and so now we somehow have to get the derivative of rho of r prime tr over r d3 right. Okay, let's let's try to figure out what we have there, what is the gradient with respect to r of rho of r prime R over R. Well, there's these two terms here. So we can say this is rho of TR prime TR times the gradient of 1 over R. And we have the second term as 1 over R. Gradient respect to R, right? Rho prime T. Okay, so what is the first term is relatively easy, right? It's only that's only a radial dependence here. And I have written what's the what's the gradient is here. The gradient of something if there's only a radial dependence, and it's just the r unit vector the f over the r. The function is 1 over r, gives you 1 over r squared. Right? So, you know that radiant of 1 over r is just. But, so what do we have here? Gradient, gradient with respect to this point, this point, of rho of r and t retarded. Is there anything at all? Is there, is there a derivative or is there just zero? Because this is our prime, we're taking the derivative with respect to r, so there's no derivative here, right? What about TR? TR, remember, TR is T minus R minus R prime absolute value over C, right? There's an R dependence here. Which effectively that means so if you sit in here, you take the derivative. We need to see how things change if you wobble around a little bit here. If you go a little bit away from the source, <coughs> that means you look at the source at an earlier time, right? because the light information takes longer to travel. So if you wobble around in space, you change the time at which you see the source. So that's a derivative that comes in here. So, the gradient with respect to R of rho of R prime and TR is then, well, the gradient only comes in through the time dependence. So we have a rho dot. I'm familiar with the way of writing time dependences, right? At R prime and TR. 
times the gradient with respect to R of T R. Let's figure out what the gradient of T R is. The gradient of T R equals, so it's the gradient of this. Usually T doesn't depend on R, but there's a minus one over C. And so then we have minus one over C, the gradient of R, uh, the length R, the gradient of the length of the radial vector is just okay, that here again. F is then simply just R, so the R of the R is 1. Okay? So this simply gets the unit vector in the radial direction. This is the unit vector. OS minus R unit vector. Okay, so this is minus dot of R prime as you R unit vector. Okay, so we have our first step here. That's our gradient of B, T, is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, integrating over all R prime, these two terms here. So we have one term rho of R prime, TR, and the gradient one of R is minus R unit vector over R squared, right? That's the first term here. And the second one is has also a minus here, is this one divided by R, right? So minus front of R prime T R also our unit vector over R C. And we integrate all this over R. Alright, that was our first step. Now we need to do that again essentially. Take the divergence of this to get the Laplace. Mm -hmm. So let's continue here. Yeah. Everybody is this now? Right. 
and then we have a second term by unit vector over r squared times the gradient of Right? All right. What's this one? The divergence of r unit vector over r squared. And also, maybe this looks even more familiar. That's the second derivative of uh, so the the plus of one over r, right? What is that? Look familiar somehow. Most of you have actually used that in the homework solutions. So it should look familiar somehow. Yeah. So, uh, direct delta function. Exactly. Very good. So that's 4 pi times direct delta, right? So this is 4 pi delta of, I can write it out, r minus r prime, right? Times rho of r prime. That's the first term here. And plus, well, gradient of rho, we have one plated here. And gradient of rho is this one, minus rho dot r unit vector of c. Right? So it gives us a minus r unit vector over r squared. And this is rho dot. Our 
argument vector over R. Let's look at that here, the divergence of something that has only an R dependence. The R is 1 over R. So there's an R left. You can the R of the R as 1. So we're left with the 1 over R squared. So all right. So we put these together. Then so we just add all of these up here. We have the delta function. We have one minus rho dot over r squared c. And here we get a plus rho dot over r squared c. So these two will cancel out. So these, these two here will cancel out. So we're left with only these two terms here. So what we're left with is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught integral of. So now let's get the signs. In both both of these came in with a minus sign here. So we have a minus sign here, minus 4 pi delta of r minus r prime. And we have a minus, not another minus here gives us a plus, plus rho dot dot of So we have calculated that 